Hi, and welcome to Africa Fintech Rising, a podcast from the Africa Fintech Summit. Uh, as you know, I hope you know, uh, the Africa Fintech Summit is coming up very quickly on April 19th at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Uh, this event is going to be ahead of the spring meeting of the World Bank and IMF. Uh, it's in uh, coordination with the U.S. Nigeria Council, their annual reception and dinner in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a very busy uh, and active time in Washington uh, with a lot of uh, foreign leaders in town. And we're taking advantage of that timing to gather disruptors, tech and finance professionals, regulators, central bank governors, uh, and investors from across Africa and the U.S. to really discuss technologies that are revolutionizing finance on the continent. Uh, if you're listening to this, you're no stranger to uh, the ubiquity of fintech. Uh, fintech is disrupting banking, finance, even money as we know it, everywhere. Uh, but in Africa specifically, the impact has the potential to be transformational. Uh, socially and economically, uh, and that's creating lots of opportunities for innovation uh, and investment. So we're really excited to uh, feature some of the leading thinkers and players uh, at the National Press Club on April 19th, and to feature a few of them here on the podcast. Uh, today we are talking specifically about Africa's uh, very dynamic payments landscape, uh, and we're really lucky to have uh, a couple of very interesting interviewees. First is uh, Vahid Monajin, CEO of Noman Nomanini, uh, which is a South African-based platform that provides uh, transactions of at informal points of sale. Uh, so really taps into the cash-based informal sector, uh, which is 41% of GDP in Africa. Great interview, great guy. Uh, stay tuned for that. We're also very lucky to have on today's pod uh, Tayo Avioso, who is the CEO of Paga. Uh, if you're familiar with FinTech in Africa at all, you know this name. Uh, Paga is a mobile payments company that uh, Tayo founded in 2009 to enable universal access to financial services for Nigerians. So it's one of the most successful financial services companies in uh, not only Nigeria, but uh, Africa as a whole. So two really great people uh, and great interviews coming up. So stick around and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Uh, as promised, we have on the line Tayo Oviosu, C CEO of Paga. Uh, a mobile payments company that he founded uh, in 2009, which is taking over Nigeria and taking over the world. <laughs> Daya, thanks for joining us. Leland, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be on. Daya, are you, um, I assume we're talking to you at, uh, at Paga's HQ in Yaba? Yes, I am here in Yaba in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and uh, on, on in the area that is sort of known as the tech ecosystem uh, hub for for Nigeria, uh, Yaba Valley. That's right. Yeah, our our uh, our African listeners are going to know this, but maybe for U.S. audiences, uh, Yaba is known as um, Yaba Cone Valley. Yep. Yeah. So kind of a, a very emerging tech hub there in uh, in Lagos. Uh, so a dynamic area of a of a dynamic city. Tao, we have a lot to talk about. First, um, I want to say that we're really excited to have you at the Africa Fintech Summit on April 19th. Um, we have uh, talked a little bit about what you're going to be talking about, but you're going to be delivering an address. Um, and I know a lot of people are, are looking forward to that. So thanks for that. Likewise. No, a pleasure. I'm looking forward to being there. And just a little bit about uh, Paga, especially for our, for our U U.S. audiences. Mm. Paga, you called last time we talked. You you still called yourself a startup, but that's starting to be a, a stretch. You have uh, a few hundred employees and several thousand agents, and uh, what is it about six million users now? So we, we just crossed eight million users at last weekend. Um, so we're very very excited about that. Um, and so um, you know, yeah. I mean, how do you define a startup, right? Um, I, I think in, in my in my mind's eye, I still think of us as a startup. But um, really, you know, a bit about the company. You know, what we're trying to do here is solve two problems, uh, which is, you know, how do you pay and get paid, and how do you deliver financial services to the mass market? Um, and and I feel like we're, you know, while we've been operational to the market for five years, offering our service to the market for five years. 
um, it still feels and, and, and we've gotten profitable. It still feels to me like we're, you know, we're still in the early days of this long journey. Right. Um, because 8 million users, there's 70 million on bank in Nigeria. Um, the largest bank in Nigeria has just about 12 million customers. So when I think about Nigeria and the population of Nigeria, we have a long way to go to, um, to bank the bank Nigerians um, and to make payments easier in Nigeria. Consider uh, Paga has has eight million uh, users. That puts you on par with the the in terms of reach with the largest banks in Nigeria. Yeah, so I said seventy million. But yeah, in terms of in terms of our current customer base, we are we're very on par with um, you know a, a number of the banks. Um, so we feel very, very proud about that. Um, and we know that we have very strong plans to aggressively grow our reach um, and our impact in the country um, as well. Yeah, really eager to ask you about the uh, b- about the growth strategy going forward. Uh, but before we look into the future, I might ask you to look uh, back at the past. Tao, you uh, spent a lot of years in the U.S., uh, I think 14 years uh, you went to USC to study electrical engineering. You were famously fired from your first job, uh, which is something you speak about and, and have written about very articulately in the past and uh, how it's shaped your view on running a company and on HR and uh, something you've uh, expressed gratitude for because you went on to a, a very successful career in the U.S. After uh, a decade and a half and quite a number of successes, in America, what brought you back to Nigeria? Yeah, so for me, like, um, you know, I, I, I'm a bit of an adventurer in the first place, um, you know, and I had a great career in the US um, and I was working for, you know, I'd gone to business school at Stanford and was working at Cisco Systems and the acquisitions and venture team, very exciting place to be. Um, and, and yeah, and I had ideas of setting up a company um, in the U S and doing something on my own there. Um, and, but in the midst of all of that, um, I was working on a project for Cisco in, in South Africa, uh, where I was doing a transaction there. And, um, a number of my friends who are working in Nigeria and living in South Africa, um, started encouraging me to think about moving back to Nigeria, you know? Um, and one of them said something that, you know, that really struck me. Um, he said, you know, Nigeria felt to him like where India, China were 15 years prior. And, and this was in 2007, you know, said in Nigeria, you had seen, you know, steady growth over the last five years and you'd seen easier to do business. Um, and he said, imagine, you know, being back in Nigeria would be like being in India 15 years ago and the companies that were in India 15 years ago, starting up where, you know, Accelo Metal, Tata, Infosys, these are now global names, not just, you know, uh, Indian conglomerates. Um, and so he so said, that's the kind of impact you can go have. And that really struck a chord to me. So fundamentally, what brought me back was my desire to be part of the redevelopment of Nigeria um, and the opportunity to to have an impact on my country, but also to do to do well financially. Um, and and so I decided to pack my bags in 2008, uh, joined a private equity firm uh, here in Lagos. Um, I ended up leaving that about six months later, more convinced about Nigeria and decided to spend three months looking at, um, well, decided to spend some time looking at, um, you know, different entrepreneurial ideas um, before I honed in on what what is now Paga. Once you started Paga, I mean, you, you bootstrapped uh, in the beginning. Um, yep. And, but as we mentioned, you've, you've scaled uh, tremendously since that time. What is it about Paga that, that allowed it to scale to such an extent? Was it the tech? Was it the team? Was it the market? Was it some combination of all? It's a combination of things. Um, and, you know, first of all, I, you know, I know that we have been very lucky um, because, you know, we on so many levels were the exception, not the rule. Um, and so first of all, we've just been very lucky to have a fantastic team of people um, who are passionate about the mission and passionate about what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, a great set of investors who continue to support us. And, 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 you know, for the first two years of Paga, we did not have a license, right? So started in 2009, started raising angel money. I think the first money in was November, 2009. 
Um, and we, we didn't have a license for the first two years, so we couldn't put anything out to the public. Um, but yet we were working very hard every day and we we're paying salaries and knock on wood, we've never missed, you know, a month of salaries here. Um, and you know, and, and that was just because of our investors, uh, because of the people who have faith in us and believed in us. Um, and so now we've built a company that is mission driven, um, and, and, and a platform that is very scalable. Um, and we believe it's through partnerships that we will, um, we will achieve our goals. And so, so this is, you know, I think at the, you know, on the underlying sort of our business today now is these things that help us grow faster by partnering with other people as well. Hmm. That's interesting. That's something I'm hearing a lot from our, uh, from a lot of the speakers and participants that are going to be at the, the, uh, Africa FinTech summit is this partnership model. You know, I know here in the U S and, uh, in Europe, fintechs and banks for example were often seen as competitors um mm -hmm. whereas africa always had this partnership model and now the the developed world is adopting the partnership model so that's one of many examples of of how i would say the african fintech scene was was ahead of the curve globally uh, and yeah and, 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 may, and maybe and maybe it's because we were you know a sort of forced to in some way right which is also good because you know um you know, the strengths, you know, if I look at our business as an example, one of the key strengths and capabilities that we have undoubtedly built for anyone is the ability to build and manage a network of financial distribution points called agents, right? Um, and these are mom and pop shops, pharmacies, grocery stores, where you're able to have render financial services. It is how any financial institution in a country such as Nigeria, as big as Nigeria, is going to reach the mass market. It's not by building brick and mortar bank branches. And so it, you know, it behooves the banks to work with us to partner on that, right? Um, because we built that ecosystem. And so, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the banks really keen to figure out how do they work with us um, to, you know, to reach the mass market through the ecosystem that we built. Mm. You know, speaking of that ecosystem, I'm uh, I'm curious how that has changed since uh, since the genesis of Paga. This was about 2009 when you first went to market. Correct. What have been the biggest changes in the ecosystem, and what are the changes you would like to to see in the in the near to medium term? Yeah, so so for us, um, you know, we we now have about 14,000 agents um, who are all over Nigeria, 36 states. Um, I have very aggressive plans. I mean, this year we'll probably scale that network to somewhere around 30, 35,000 agents, um, and, and move quite aggressively in doing so. Um, so, so for me, you, you know, and the majority of our customers go to those agents and do transactions. I think a big thing that we're going to see change is as we double down on mobile money and the part, which is a part of our business and on people sending money with, you know, to each other. Um, and, and a lot of regulation has changed over the years has been very helpful to this. So now the transaction limits have changed to allow people to be able to send money. Um, we now have something in Nigeria called the biometric verification number where, you know, we can easily KYC people and upgrade them, determine who they are. Um, and these changes are going to really help drive mobile money. Um, and, and we now have uh, what's called USSD on all mobile networks. So you can now start 242 hash and get a menu up from any dumb phone. Um, so I see these things as things that are going to really help us drive and scale the adoption of P2P transfers. Um, and, and that's something that we're squarely focused, focused on. So I see that as the next bounce of the ball for, for us. Hmm. Are there any regulatory reforms that you're hoping for and pushing for now? Yeah, the main, the main regulatory reform we're, we're working on with the, with the central bank is around allowing us to offer other types of financial services ourselves directly, right? Um, so we are about launching a savings product. Um, we should, we you know, would, would have launched it by the time we have the fintech, fintech, uh, conference. Um, so, you know, with that, we're doing a partnership with someone. Um, but it's something where the regulator ought to allow us to do that directly. Um, but also micro lending, um, you know, it's very important for the mass market for people to be able to save, but also to be able to lend. Um, and, and I think these are services that 
you know, are just like the base things that you should be able to allow um, a mobile money operator like us to be able to do. Ah, great. You know, you, um, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, chatting with you a few times there in Lagos, uh, and we inevitably come to this subject of a, a cashless society. This is something I've mm. bring up a couple of times. Yeah. How is that a pipe dream? You know, the cash is still king uh, in the world, but in, in Nigeria especially. And uh, it seems like that's that that's a long way off. Is that a, a realistically attainable yeah. uh, vision? And what, what would need to happen to make that a reality? Yeah. So, look, um, I think a cashless society in Nigeria in my lifetime, um, I, you know, I don't see it happening. Right. Um, unless there's a major, major, major fundamental uh, movement in terms of very radically moving digital um, and moving digital from the perspective of crypto digital. Right. Like cryptocurrency, the entire country is going that way. Um, so if that happens, then great. But I see us having a cash light society, um, which is sort of, I think, more realistic um, you know, cash is still king around the world, you know, um, and, and, and people ignore that it takes time for these changes to happen. You know, um, I was in London, um, a week ago and, and I gave my car to, to the bartender and he actually immediately tried to tap it on the POS. Right. And I'm like, Oh, it's, it's a U.S. card. It's not a tap. He's like, Oh gosh. And then put it in. And I'm like, isn't that interesting that now you try to tap, right? Uh -huh. But how did he get there? The way he got there was everybody was using the Oyster card, right? right. And everybody's, you know, everybody was first of all buying tickets for the Oyster, for the, for the underground. And then they had the Oyster card and they, you know, incentivized you to use the Oyster card by giving you discounts. And then they took away the discounts when everybody had an Oyster card. And then now they said, hey, you just use your, your bank card. So you can now just tap everywhere. And now POSs are going around with NFC, right? Um, and so people now get adjusted to it. So I look at it that it's just going to take a lot of time to adjust people's minds unless there's a radical change. Um, and if, you know, outside of that, you know, on the regulatory side, there's just so many, um, hurdles to get the regulators to understand and keep up with new technology. That said though, I think in, in, in our lifetime, we will see one, at least one country go 100% digital. Um, and I have my money on Sweden. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think, I think Sweden or one of the Nordics will be, will be the first to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I was remind in terms of radical changes. Uh, I was reminded of uh, something the other day. I was talking to a friend of mine who does uh, cybersecurity there in Lagos. Mm -hmm. He used to do regular security. They had a helicopter and a kind of a SWAT team, and would offer uh. security services. He actually that business went out of business when people stopped carrying so much cash. Basically, when ATMs mm. proliferated. Um, oh wow! It just, yeah. just became a safer city. So, and that was you sure. know, thirteen years ago. So. Those changes can happen pretty quickly. Yeah, no, it can. It actually can. So, but it takes really having the um, you know the impetus um, and the uh, the drive to do it from from the from the top, right? Right. Interesting. And you bring up a, another interesting point about regulators not always being tuned in um, to what's going on uh, on the innovation side. That was one of our, uh, you know, our driving forces with the Africa FinTech Summit. We wanted to make sure we had some regulators on board. And I originally thought it was going to be very beneficial for the audience and uh, tech and finance professionals and investors to hear from the regulators. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that the real benefit was from the regulators hearing from from you all. Yeah. yeah, and I'm actually I'm actually hoping that you do get the central bank governor of Nigeria, um, and I'm hoping that he um, he actually stays and stays through to hear the presentations and the conversations, right? I hope so as well. Um, we're we're pretty close to confirming that, but as of now, we have the uh, central bank governor at the at the front doing the keynote at the beginning, and we have the central okay. bank governor of uh, Kenya uh, at the very end. So. That's a okay. str strategic Fantastic. placement to try to ensure the, that uh, they'll stay throughout. Fantastic. Well, before we uh, before we finally close here, I want to ask you about another thing. I know you have um, have uh, become an angel investor yourself uh, of yeah. late. 
Tell us about what's your motivation there and what you look for as an angel investor. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think for me, my, you know, I actually want my life work to really be around helping to, um, you know, improve the, you know, the entire life cycle of, uh, of financing for startups from, you know, from the seed stage all the way through to series C to exit. Um, and, and so right now, um, I see, you know, my role, you know, as someone who has had, you know, now nine years of running my own business, um, as, a, as an opportunity for me to share my experience with other people, um, to help them not make the mistakes that I made, um, and to, and to help, you know, find the best and brightest entrepreneurs going after big problems, um, and saying, how can we help you? Right. Um, and, and so what I've done with a friend is it's a hobby um, of mine. So what I've done with a friend is we've raised, um, you know, we have a, an angel club and we've raised some money. And, uh, and yeah, we're investing in a, in, 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 in a few in a few opportunities where I'm about to make our first our first investments. Um, but yeah, but I'm very excited about the, the, the entrepreneurs we're talking to right now and the, and the things that we're looking at. We're very interested in looking at healthcare. care. Uh, we think this is just the number one leveler in, in, in a place like Nigeria where we have just very poor healthcare. Um, and so the question is how do we provide services? Um, and there's so many elements of that healthcare chain that are very interesting. And we're finding some entrepreneurs going after it in, in radically different ways. Um, the second is, um, you know, in, in, you know, looking at, um, you know, agriculture, right. Um, and, and looking at how do we, you know, how do we process, um, you know, where, you know, lot, lot of arable land, um, but yet we still import processed products for a lot of things. Right. So why, why is that the case? Are there better ways to, um, to go after, after the problems, you know, on in the agri space. And then finally we like the consumer consumer side. Right. And so we're looking at the, at, at consumer, consumer products, um, you know, tech enabled is fine. Um, but consumer facing stuff, uh, where, where we're looking at that as well. So for us, it's a, it's a small beginning, but, um, but the idea is that we want to be able to help entrepreneurs both in terms of, and my partner has, you know, background in fund, you know, in investments as well, um, private equity and my background in, in venture capital and, and running a business to help entrepreneurs, not just on the funding side of things, but also help them on the day to day of their businesses. So it's, uh, it's actually a lot of fun. So it's, uh, it's what I do in my downtime. <laughs> I have a feeling you don't have a lot of downtime. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. But uh, one of the companies, I have a WhatsApp from them waiting saying, hi, are you back in town? Right? Uh, it's one of the entrepreneurs. And, you know, and that's the kind of thing that I respond to after work hours. And I'm like, yeah, we're back. Like, you know, how can I help? What's going on? And that's a mobile gaming company I invested in. Uh, and I, I love the... The, the concept and idea of what they're doing and at least two entrepreneurs have just been fantastic. Well, I know uh, they're probably hitting you up on WhatsApp and I know it's also uh, getting to be after hours on a Friday afternoon there in Lego. So uh, we won't keep you any longer, but I'll just say, Taya, we're really, really excited to um, to hear you in Washington on April 19th. So we're really excited about that and we appreciate your time uh, on the podcast. Neil, and thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it as well. And, um, you know, I'm hoping it's a, a wonderful experience. All right. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, as promised, we are joined on the line by Vahid Monajim, who is the CEO of Nomanini. Vahid, thanks very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And what does Nomanini mean? So... I grew up in Swaziland, um, and in Swaziland they speak Siswati. In Siswati, Nomanini means anytime. Um, it's pretty much the same word in Zulu and Kosa. Um, and it, you know, we chose that name based on um, the desire to build access and provide ubiquity for uh, payments and uh, digital transactions. Great. Can you tell us about that ubiquity? How, how does Nomanini work exactly? So what Domini does is uh, we, we work with informal retailers. So uh, think about uh, traders on the street or small independent bricks and mortars retailers. Um, 
these are really the the largest traders uh, in Africa. More than 80 or 90 percent of retail is informal based. We enable those retailers to provide a full set of transactions. So you could walk into your local corner store or to a street vendor and pay your mobile bill, um, transfer money to someone, withdraw cash from an account, uh, even in some cases open accounts. And so we essentially bring, bring banking to your local corner store. Uh, and I, I'll tell you more about uh, how we do that and the kinds of partnerships we have to form uh, to do that uh, at scale. Yeah, well, I'm very interested in that. First of all, can you tell us about the uh, about the growth of the company? What was the the origin story, and uh, how how big are you today? Sure. Um, so uh, we've we started five years ago, very much focused on um, digitizing the mobile airtime trade. So uh, even today, the one of the biggest digital tokens of value that's available across the continent is. Uh, mobile airtime. So these are small prepaid top-up cards, uh, literally usually printed cards that uh, you scratch off a number to reveal a unique code, which will represent 50 cents or 10 cents or a dollar worth of mobile talk time or SMS or uh, data service. We started just trying to digitize that. Um, it was fascinating to us that there was literally billions of dollars of um, mobile service being paid for using these paper cards. Um, uh, very quickly, um, other products and services uh, were asked for by the merchants we were working with. So, uh, you know, the beginnings of the mobile money revolution, uh, now that banks are getting involved, agency banking uh, transactions as well are, are being included in the platform. Um, we started initially working with informal retailers. Uh, very quickly, we, you know, we spent a lot of time learning and understanding their business and their needs. But we came across a bit of a hidden channel to reach them, which was the existing distributors. Um, and so, in uh, one of the one of the informal areas of where we were working in Cape Town, uh, we came across a, a mobile distributor who, you know, we assumed that we would be kind of competing with them because they make some of their income um, distributing these uh, mobile scratch cards. And they actually came to us and said, "Could we distribute distribute your product and um, earn some of the commission uh, while doing that?" And that's kind of where we started in the last couple of years looking at the informal distribution channels. And I think this is where it got really exciting. Um, the, you know, you can't go anywhere in Africa where you can't buy a mobile top up, usually via a card or um, a can of Coke. And we've had the privilege of working with uh, mobile and fast moving consumer goods distributors uh, in half a dozen countries across Africa. Um, it's given us a good sense for uh, what's different about all the different markets or the ones we operated anyway, but also what are the common issues. Um, and so uh, four, three years ago, we white labeled our solutions um, and, and worked with distributors in these countries. More recently, uh, and Maybe to give you a sense of uh, growth, uh, one of these distributors um, in Mozambique grew from pretty much no merchants to almost 2,000 merchants um, in the course of uh, 18 months, less than 18 months, in fact. And uh, they're doing uh, one and a half million transactions a month off that, off that uh, very quick start. What we saw was we we need to work with we needed to work with more distributors, and we needed to uh, have a better way to finance their operations. So last year we decided to begin working with banks. Uh, we're uh, we have a partnership with one bank um, and two more that are forming uh, currently. And under these partnerships, we uh, do what we've been doing for the last few years of building better consolidated products specifically for informal, mar informal merchants and rolling those out with the existing distribution channels. Um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I like this point you make about um, in the early days you saw these airtime vendors as, as uh, potential competitors, but then you moved into a, a partnership model. It reminds me of an article you wrote um, along a similar line. You said in the early days you tried to set up your own uh, – uh, electronic wallets to provide a, mm. a full end-to-end -end solution. 
but but as you developed, you you realized that new players uh, could could offer a potentially better solution. Mm. Can you offer any advice to to other fintechs uh, who might be transitioning into sort of a more partnership based model? Um, so I think one of the features of operating in Africa is that quite often um, people are operating within just one country and therefore within quite a limited uh, size of economy. Um, you know, the entire uh, GDP of South Africa is about the same as, as um, Alabama in terms of GDP size. And so what tends to happen is the local players tend to try to do everything uh, within that context. So they'll do tools for merchants, tools for agency banking, tools for consumer wallets, um, uh, lending on top of that, and they try to become the jack of all trades uh, in their context. And really outside of the you know, Nigeria, South Africa, and maybe Kenya or Ethiopia, um, there isn't quite enough scale to do that really well. Um, so I think I think one of you know I think my first uh, the first thing that we learned was decide what is going to be your point of excellence and just double and triple down on it and say yes we know there's a really interesting opportunity to create a, a wallet for consumers but what we're going to focus on and what we're going to become the world's best at is being the ones to provide a consolidated product to merchants. Um, so yeah so I think I think knowing what you want to focus on. And therefore, being willing to let go of other things is really, really important. Um, I think the other difficult thing about operating in Africa is um, you, you kind of have to choose between either taking concentration risk and just working in one market or taking a different kind of concentration risk and spreading yourself out and not being able to concentrate on one market. And the reality is, you know, these, these markets are quite different uh, in terms of language, uh, the structure of the retail uh, economy, um, the uh, user preferences, uh, legal regimes is all quite different. Um, yeah, and so you, to, to what makes it even more difficult is that it's quite expensive to operate between countries. Um, you know, everything from work permits to cost of flights and logistics, uh, it can be expensive in terms of direct cost and time. Um, and I think that's that's one of the the one of the hurdles that I think companies have to get over is figuring out how to specialize. And if you're specializing, it's more and more likely that you're going to want to operate and, and share those services across other markets. Um, I think those will be my two main uh, kind of takeaways from what we've we've learned over the last few years is just specialize and tr thread that needle between trying to be in too many markets or bearing concentration risk of being in just concentrated one. Right. And how does Nomanini deal with with that latter in terms of markets? You're you're South African based. What's your what's your geographic footprint and geographic ambitions? So, um, kind of the last couple of years, we've been working with uh, directly with distributors, and we've been doing that. Um, really, we've got uh, across South, East, and West Africa, um, and that was to intentionally try to get an understanding of what are the challenges and requirements and conditions in these different markets. <laughs> We knew we we're not going to be able to scale kind of in five, in three different regions or in five countries simultaneously. So the, you know, our ambition at the moment is to scale in Southern Africa. It's kind of closer to our home base. Um, and, uh, you know, from there, then create uh, regional centers in East and West Africa. Interesting. Yeah. Do you have specific jurisdictions in mind or do you view them reasonably? So we do, you know, Kind of the, the, the lens that we have is uh, we we look at Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa more specifically, and that that's where we have uh, most of our experience and uh, most of the benefit of that experience. The 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 view we have is you know South Africa is uh, very different, especially in the in terms of the infrastructure and the retail economy, to the rest of Africa. Um, so it's not really, you know, if we win there, it's really 
uncertain whether our recipe will translate to other markets. So it's not, a, despite its size, it's not a not a priority market for us. Um, sim, you know, we view sem, uh, Kenya similarly. It's there's a very unusual situation there with um, you know amazing uptake in terms of digital uh, uh, transactions and electronic payments in the mass market um, but we think that's very unlike uh, the rest of the economy the rest of the other countries as they stand um, lastly Nigeria again we see great players like Apaga in Nigeria um, we see quite often um, players coming in from outside and you know, having to learn very expensive lessons of, of what it takes to operate in Nigeria. What we rather do is we focus on the next tier of countries. So, you know, set three quarters of a million people don't live in Nigeria, South Africa, or Kenya, where most of the attention is focused. They live in countries like Mozambique or Cote d'Ivoire. Um, you know, the, that our sweet spot for the next few years is on countries that are between 10 and 40 million people um, and learning how to uh, re repeat the recipe and bring the uh, configurations to suit each one of those. Well, uh, you know, among the, the many concerns that, uh, that fintechs have as they, as they grow, uh, you know, besides scale and tech and markets is, of course, uh, money, financing and, and fundraising. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your journey on that side and uh, if you have any uh, w words of advice for aspiring aspiring fintechs? Uh, sure, yeah. So we, uh, we started out um, with the kind of typical friends and family uh, round, early stage, did um, uh, it was one or two hundred thousand uh, dollars collectively. Uh, we, we were also very lucky early on to benefit from uh, a government grant uh, to do with technology development uh, in the country, uh, which uh, boosted us very quickly. Um, since then, we've raised about three and a half million dollars, uh, primarily from European-based investors. So, in fact, entirely from European-based investors. We've got three. Uh, kind of institutional investors, uh, Eva Fund uh, out of Amsterdam is a seed venture fund that invested a uh, million dollars. Um, we also got a London-based family office investing uh, a little under a million dollars, and then more recently, uh, Goodwell, a uh, specialist investor in uh, now in fintech in Africa, uh, uh, putting in one and a half million dollars. Interesting. One of our uh, panels at the Africa FinTech Summit is going to be focused on, uh, we have a couple of venture capital panels. Uh, one of them is specifically going to be focused on uh, this idea of forget everything you've learned in Silicon Valley, <laughs> sort of lessons about how uh, um, African tech needs African-specific funding structures. Mm. Is this, does that resonate with your experience? Oh, hugely. Um, I, the kind of aping of Silicon Valley conventions uh, in Africa, I, I think we've, we've fallen victim uh, to that ourselves. Um, kind of with the benefit of hindsight, uh, there's a lot of wisdom in that, but then also a lot of places where it's not applicable. Uh, I'll, I'll start with kind of maybe the, the macro, right? Um you know, the size of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP is uh, slightly less than the UK. Um, so kind of squeezing a, a billion dollar company out of this is, is going to be very difficult. Um, uh, so that that's maybe the, the first thing is just kind of how do you grow sizable companies and what is your attrition rate in your portfolio that still leaves you with a good return. And I think the um, Silicon Valley-esque uh, batting, uh, batting for uh, the bleachers uh, and hoping that you know one or two out of 10 gets there is good enough, but that's really not the case here. I think this requires um, a much better batting average uh, from investors. Um, and I think part of that batting average is also uh, being a lot more stabilizing. Uh, I think in some ways, uh, uh, some investors 
bring more questions and uncertainty and fear uh, into an organization. And given the uncertainty and kind of ex- external risks to operating in Africa, that w- there's enough of that already. Uh, you really need uh, investors that are gonna are gonna stand steady with you and uh, help navigate through those uh, difficult conditions. Um, so I think I think that's. Probably the, the the first one is macro and then, and then the attitude uh, required. Um, you know, we, we had a a, a case where um, you know two years ago, while growing massively in Mozambique, the entire Mozambican economy tanked. Uh, it was a situation where the local currency went from uh, thirty four to the dollar to seventy eight over the course of a few months, and that really distorted the market for us. Um, I think uh, because we were fortunate to have quite uh, tested Africa investors, you know, it wasn't a, a situation of recriminations and how could you have seen this? It was a bit of a, this is an inevitability of operating in this context. How do we, how do we uh, figure this out together? Uh, so I think that was, that, that mindset is really, uh, really key. Um, I think the other bit about, um, uh, I think one of our, Maybe it's my personal uh, thinking about this is I think the way that you can create scale across this fragmented continent is through partnerships with multinational corporations. And so whether they are banks or mobile operators, um, whether they are uh, fast moving consumer goods uh, manufacturers, um, whether they're retailers of, of some sort, um, the way to create scale and and create larger a larger opportunity is to, through partnerships. And this is you know our recent move into bank partnerships is very much in this vein to say how can we um, give ourselves the room to grow into more than one country at once with uh, through a partnership. Um, I'm curious to know what's coming up. I know what's coming up for you personally. You're, uh, you're training to swim the Bosphorus, uh, in Istanbul, which is, um, uh, intimidating and impressive. And I wish you luck on that. What's, uh, what's on the horizon for Nomanini? Um, so for us is really, uh, executing on these bank partnerships that we've, uh, had the, had the good fortune to establish, um, we're going to be building a, a merchant base of several tens of thousands uh, in uh, Mozambique through a single bank partnership. Um, we are already in talks with two other banks, one of which is a Pan-African bank. Um, for us, it's really, you know, we've gradually been moving from understanding the, the informal merchant condition and then moving up the value chain to understand distribution operations uh, to reach those merchants. And now we're just stepping up one more level in the value chain. It's really just consolidating our position uh, in understanding what banks want. Um, yeah, that's that's it's pretty simple for us. We, we need to get uh, more banks to sign up uh, with us so we can get to more distributors, so we can get to more merchants. Great. Well, we'll be following all that uh, all that very closely, and uh, look forward to to getting some updates from you. Brilliant, Vahid. Thanks very much. Uh, really interesting My talking, pleasure. and we really appreciate your your time and input. Right. Thank, thanks so much. Hey, that's it. Uh, a couple of great interviews for our inaugural edition of the uh, Africa FinTech Rising podcast from the Africa FinTech Summit. If I do say so myself. Uh, you can uh, check us out next week we'll be back in your feed uh, wherever you get podcasts Apple Music Stitcher or SoundCloud Uh, and please go to africafintechsummit.com to learn more about uh, about the event which is coming up on April 19th at the National Press Club in Washington D.C. we'd love to see you there you can uh, learn more on the website or write to info at africafintechsummit.com if you have specific questions and uh, we'll see you soon